Well, what, what did I see here that made me laugh? At the evening service tonight, the sermon topic will be, What is Hell? Come early and listen to our choir practice. <laughs> the low self-esteem support group will meet Thursday at 7 p.m. Please use the back door. Oh, those are great. Ted Strickland was a well-known evangelist in the Church of the Nazarene and was actually an evangelist that when I was a teenager and attending Central Ohio camp, uh, Church of the Nazarene camp on Morris Road in Columbus, Ohio, he was one of our preachers, so to speak, our youth, youth evangelists. We really liked him. But he'd traveled for many years all across the United States um, held thousands of, of meetings, and he collected church bulletins and bloopers, and that was his hobby. And he actually made a book. I wish I could get a hold of the book. I do remember one in particular. It said, "Come here, come tonight, and hear Sister Belch all the way from Africa." <laughs> I remember that one. Well, Father, we thank you that we can laugh. That you are a God of joy and of strength and of love and of peace, of power, of fidelity, of, of all of that which we need. We pray your blessing upon today. We ask, O oh God, that you will help us, help me, as I seek to teach about the word that you have given to us, to, given to mankind. I pray that you will open our minds and help us, Lord, to absorb what you would have us to for the betterment of our walk with you and your kingdom. In Christ's name, amen. All right, <clears throat> so we're going to, we've entitled it, this exciting title, Old Testament Survey. I just put Old Testament up there. But we're going to use as our theme, Matthew, the fifth chapter, and it is a reference, Jesus referencing during one of his many conversations and confrontations. Um, but he said, in 17, verse 17 of the fifth chapter, when he was teaching, he had taught the Beatitudes, he was teaching on the Beatitudes and different fundamental truths. He said, do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And so that helps us to understand. I believe that it is very easy for us in this day and age, dispensation, to mistakenly uh, assume that the Old Testament, since it is referring to the law, and the New Testament is the story of the Savior coming and the birth of Christ and the fulfillment and even moving forward into the future, the coming of Christ, that the Old Testament is really not that important anymore. And that we really should just focus most of our time on the New Testament. Unfortunately, because of that, many Christians today, not only, well, we have many Christians who are biblically illiterate. They just don't read their Bible. That's why they're so easily fooled. Their pastor can get up and tell them just about anything, and they don't even check them. They don't even do a fact check. And so they buy anything that they're being told, and that's, that's back to biblical illiteracy. But many Christians, on top of that, are very, very unlearned and unknowledgeable about the Old Testament, which we should not be. And we're going to talk about the importance of it, the, the beginning of the Old Testament, its foundation, its overview, why it's there, what God was trying to do, and uh, it will help us, I believe, today. So let's just go start very much at the beginning. Let's start at the base and let's build our way up. There are 66 books in the Bible, as we've already covered. 39 of those books are Old Testament, all right? And the Old Testament, the 66 books, just to back up a moment, are what we call the canon of scriptures. That word canon comes from a word which means measuring rod. Today we could put it into the terms of a ruler, um, of a tape measure. It also carries with it the thought of straight, something that you can measure by and something that indicates 
something, uh, uh, whether something is straight or not, whether it lines up or not, canon. Now, the Apocrypha, uh, simply, that word simply means non-canon. That's all that means. And there was not any, there was not a special board. There was not some type of special um, council of, of learned individuals that established the canon. However, it was established over a course of about 400 years. It was not immediately established. It was established over a course of, of about 400 years by both church fathers and by the general population of believers themselves. It was, it was established on consensus that these are the books that are most beneficial to um, and, and have a contain the measuring rod of what Christianity is and how a per person should live. And uh, the Apocrypha is not a condemned source of reading. It isn't that we're told that we shouldn't read the Apocrypha. They're just not to be used, and this is something that is held true for thousands of years. They're not to be used as a matter to, of measurement but uh, they may have truth in them, but they're not considered as inspired as the canon. And the Bible, by the way, the book Bible means ta biblia, meaning the book. The Bible, the book. That's what it simply means. All right. Well, let's get into why study the Old Testament. First of all, we can't understand the New Testament without the Old Testament. As you read through your New Testament, in my, my particular copy of the scriptures has cross what are called cross references those cross references and you remember in our first study that we said the bible is its own best explanation and commentary you you understand the bible by the bible that is the best way to understand what it means and through many many thousands upon thousands of hours and days of work learned individuals have cross-referenced what you're reading in the New Testament, often with the Old Testament, indicating that to truly understand and, and receive the depth of meaning, sometimes the meaning itself, you need to go to an Old Testament reference. And so we don't, that's, this is number one reason we don't discard the Old Testament. Number one reason we don't throw away the Old Testament and ignore it. Because we really can't understand the New Testament if we don't reference the Old Testament and know the Old Testament. And many individuals have basic questions about the New Testament that would really be solved if they knew their Old Testament. But they don't study the Old Testament. And so it's very, very important that we understand it. Let me give you some stats that, that are just amazing and revealing. The New Testament contains 295 references to the Old Testament. And so the New Testament, the writers of the New Testament, those inspired, the Bible says people, men inspired by the Holy Spirit, those writers were inspired to even refer to the Old Testament in building their case and in telling the story. And so the Old Testament is needed. 224 times those Old Testament references are introduced by the writer as God says. So that's giving authority to the Old Testament. You see that? The New Testament writers are saying of the Old Testament, God said. So they, they're, they're saying God wrote, God spoke in the Old Testament. Or they say, they preface it, Jesus used it often, did he not? It is written. He even quoted that to the devil. It is written. It is written. It is written. By that statement, Jesus and the other authors are giving credibility to the Old Testament. In fact, Jesus relied upon the Old Testament to gain victory in his temptation, the great temptation with the devil, a temptation that was that encompassed and contained and was, was more intense than anything you and I would ever go through. But the Bible says he was tempted in all points. The measure and the breadth and all of the subjects of which Jesus was tempted, and we have the, the, three, the breakdown of the three basic areas just 
to give us a synopsis of what Jesus was tempted with. But we have no idea what type of temptation he went through and the various types. And he fended off that, that, in that battle the devil by saying, it is written. So Jesus himself, the word of God, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word of God is giving credibility to the Old Testament by saying, it is written. And then we find that uh, there are 278 different verses, uh, 56 times, I didn't put it up here, but 56 times the New Testament refers to God as the author, specifically as the author of the Old Testament. And then I thought this was interesting. In the book of Revelation, there are 15 references to the Old Testament per chapter. Average is about 15 references per chapter. So even the book of Revelation, where John is given this, the heavens are opened and John is taken, an amazing journey to show us what is unfolding and what will be, uh, 15 times average per chapter, the Old Testament is referred to. So all of that should give us uh, a, a firm understanding as to how important the Old Testament is to our understanding. Because those who came before us, they saw and they relied upon the Old Testament. And remember, the early church didn't have the New Testament. It was not written for decades. So the early church, how were they living for Jesus? What were they using? How were they basing their, what were they basing their faith upon? How were they constructing their arguments in, in their faith all upon the Old Testament? They were living, living their new life through the Old Testament and the abundance of scripture that proved uh, and reinforced that Jesus, ha Messiah, Jesus was the Messiah, was found in the Old Testament. They couldn't refer to Paul. Paul, was, Paul came a little bit later, and they could, so they had to refer to the Old Testament. Now let's, let's talk about, well, let me back up a moment. Great doctrinal truths are developed in the Old Testament. That's another reason we need to know this. There are, there are doctrinal truths. There's a pattern that is established in the Old Testament. A basic understanding of who God is. We learn that in the Old Testament. We learn about his attributes. We learn, you remember we talked about his names. That was all established in the Old Testament. We, we learn about his majesty. We learn about his power in the Old Testament. We, we, get an, we get an idea as to who God is, and that's all framed for us in the Old Testament. And, and who God is, not, not just we see, many people see God as the God of the law. God was stern in the Old Testament. But we see God as a, as a God of not only holiness and righteousness and sovereignty, but we see his love and his goodness in the Old Testament. Um, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I mean, how, you can't get any better than that, right? We see, that, we see the various aspects of God's person in the Old Testament. That's built for us there. We need that foundation. And then it helps us to have a richer understanding of what's going on in the New Testament. And you remember that Jesus said... Jesus said this, did he not, to his, to his people. Remember, the Jewish people were raised, the average Jewish person was raised in, in the law, in the Torah. They learned that as a little child up. And so the people that Jesus was speaking to had knowledge of the scripture. They were very knowledgeable of the scripture. They could quote the scripture. The average Jewish individual Regardless whether they were a quote unquote peasant or not, they were very well educated in comparison to the other nations around them. They knew the Old Testament. That's why Jesus would so often say, it is written, or have you not read? It is written, because he knew they did know it. He knew they had heard it. But you remember that Jesus, as a reference point, in explaining to them who he was and what he was there and what he, what he was about, do you remember he said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. You remember he began to reference who he was 
in, in reference to who God is, and that would have been based upon the Old Testament. And so we see that the understanding of who God is, and then we see the progression, and by the way, we'll go, we, this reference is going to be our theme, but we also recognize that it is not past tense. The Old Testament also must not be viewed as merely um, background history foundational, which it is, but it also must be recognized the Old Testament is still the Word of God. It still has authority, and it's still relevant for today. Why do we know that? I, I quoted it earlier, but think about this. Jesus said, it is written when he quoted it. It is written. He didn't say it was written or in the past. He said it is. That, that phrase is present tense, meaning that even to that moment, Jesus is saying this is alive and it's still relevant and it's still for today. So if, if David's psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, we should be glad, should we not, that it's not relegated to back then. I wish the Lord was my shepherd, but he's not because that's Old Testament, right? But no, the Old Testament is relevant for today. The Lord is my shepherd. And so it is relevant. The Old Testament must not be reviewed or viewed as um, something relegated to the past, and it's a book of, book of history. There is a lot of history in it, but that's not, not, the, um, not eliminating its relevance. So what is the purpose of our lessons? Uh, what will be the purpose of our lessons? Well, we want to, I've already alluded to this a little bit, but we want to see the pattern and the progression and the unity of, first of all, the scripture. It is incredible how there's a thread of continuity and unity that runs through the Old Testament. But it also will help us to see the progression of God's plan. God, God couldn't start in the beginning and just turn the light on all at once. God had to slowly turn the light up for humanity. He had to slowly turn, the, the room was dark, dark. And he had to slowly turn the light up so that, we, so that humanity began to see, to see. And so he, this progression, you'll see a progression in, in the Old Testament. And God, through, for example, the prophets, he begins to speak of things that they don't get. And I have news for you. There's still some things we don't get, right? I mean, I, I should probably get an amen on that one. All you have to do is read the book of Revelation. And you read through the book of Revelation, you find yourself saying, well, I don't get this. And do you remember that, that the angel told John, it's sealed. So some of this, will the scroll will be unrolled as time goes on, John. You don't see it, but people behind you will see it. Things that were seen, that's why you hear me say from the pulpit quite a bit, things that were seen today, they wanted to see. Jesus told the people of that day the same thing. He said, that there are people that came before you that long to see what you're seeing. Jesus told the people of that day, they long to see what you're seeing. They read about it, but they didn't get it. You're seeing it. Well, you and I are seeing what they read about and didn't get. And we're seeing it unfold right in front of us. How in the world could one individual control the whole world? How could that be? They wrote it down. But how could it be? You and I know how it could be. We have it. Never before in the history of man. Have you been able to do this? I can text somebody on the other side of the world right now. How will one man control everyone here? And by the way, how many of you have been talking about something? This thing listens to you, right? You know that, right? 
You, you know that? And isn't it alarming and scary that you just, you just kind of sleepily nod your head that you're aware of that and you've grown accustomed to it? You're being watched. You're being listened to. You say, how did the people of other nations ever get to that place where they accepted that? We already have. You're being watched. You're being listened to. Have you ever talked about something and then all of a sudden at, just talk about it with somebody at dinner? And then ads start popping up. I don't want this. There, it's doing it. Siri, get off of my phone. Just to confirm. Did you hear it? I'm telling you. Got it. Yeah, I got it. That is exactly. And so you and I are seeing this. But we're so, how's that saying go? We're so close to the woods we can't see the trees or we're so close to the trees we can't see the woods. We're, we're right in it. And I keep saying that, trying to... Did you ever, you remember the Aqua Velva commercial? When it slapped? Thanks, I needed that. That's what I feel like doing sometimes, it's whap. Oh, thank you. And that's where we're at today. And so the pattern, it's a progression. And the scriptures are relevant and up to date. They're, they're, they are more up to date than the latest Twitter or whatever X or whatever you use. And we see that the unifying theme will be established. That theme is God's covenant. God establishes a covenant. And God is still a God of covenant today. And this, this covenant has the new covenant in my blood. So there is this, still this establishment of a covenant. Covenant is an interesting study altogether of itself in the Bible that God chose to establish a, a um, contract, for lack of a better term, with humanity, a binding contract upon himself. The word covenant, I think I've talked about that, berit, it means berit, it means to cut. Covenant was often established by, by the shedding of blood. And sometimes, if you remember the Old Testament story, where God established covenant with Abraham, they cut the, cut the sacrificial animal and split it, and they walked in between it. That's covenant. And God has established covenant. He takes it very, very, very seriously. He takes covenant so seriously that his son came and died to fulfill covenant. And he has covenant. It's giving me goosebumps. He has covenant not only with his people, but he has covenant with us if we are not of Jewish blood as well. The Gentiles. You know, you were a Gentile dog, right? You, you know that, that, that you, the, in the New Testament, referred to as Gentile dogs. But are you not glad that there's a scripture that says that we as wild branches have been grafted into the true vine to be made partakers of the Abrahamic covenant? So through the blood of Jesus, we have been grafted in and we are part of the covenant. Uh, that's what Jesus' blood did. Well, I'm off, I'm off base here, or I'm off track. So let's, let's go to a general overview, if we can, of the Old Testament. I love this board. Voila. There we are. So let's start with Genesis. First of all, the Old Testament begins in Genesis 1 through 11. We have the story of God dealing, his dealings with humanity in general. Humanity, the creation, the fall, the flood, the Tower of Babel, all of these events, are Genesis 1 through 11. And that is dealing with humanity in, in general. But in Genesis 12, something happens. And, and God does something that is so necessary for the redemption of man. Now, Genesis 1 through 11 is the story of what has happened to man, not only in creation, but after the fall. As a result of the fall, God's dealing with all of the impact, and man is dealing with the fallout because of the fall. 
But in Genesis 12, God begins to unroll. And as I said, he begins to turn the light on. On the plan of salvation. Very, very little dim light as to what he's going to do. You say, did God know what he was doing? He knew it before. And this is one of the unexplainable quandaries of of God's relationship with man. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation that Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So Jesus is not an afterthought. The cross is not an afterthought. Jesus was in place, the Son of God. I don't know how this all happened, but that plan was there prior to Adam falling. And again, we don't know how long Adam and Eve lived. You know, sometimes I think because things are happening quickly, we believe in, in Genesis, that they sinned quickly. Could have been a long, long, long time before they fell. It could have been an on, it, they might have been there for a good while, we don't know. And so, but Genesis 12, God begins to turn up the light and he selects a man named Abram, who he will later change his name to Abraham the father of many. He chooses a man named Abram. Abram has no idea. Now, isn't it interesting? All Jews were Gentiles before God chose Abram. There were no Jews in the garden. There were humans. Think about that. So they really have no bragging rights, right? Because they were all Gentiles until God chose Abram. Okay? And the Bible tells us In the kingdom, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, Greek nor, you you remember that, male or female. So, there there is this, I'm I'm getting off on a branch. Okay, I'm like the squirrel coming back here quickly. Okay. (laughs) But God's dealing with humanity. Then he chooses a man named Abram to be Abraham to create and to begin to become the father of, of a people and of a nation. And God establishes in Genesis 15, Genesis 15, God establishes a covenant with Abram. So Genesis 1 through 11 is God dealing with humanity. Genesis 12 through Malachi is God dealing with Israel. He's focusing on a nation. Now, other people will be involved, and they'll be drawn in. Um, uh, help me with the name of the lady that, that helped the spies. Rahab. Rahab, thank you. And Rahab became part of the lineage of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So a Gentile was drawn in to this story, swept in. To this story, but primarily it's it's Israel. The story is about Israel. You say, well, why Israel? God had to centralize, God had to have a people and a nation through which he could progressively work to bring about his plan for the entire world and all humanity, and he had to centralize localize his workings through one nation, through one group, so the story would stay together. Does that make sense? He couldn't, he couldn't have done some type of progressive revelation of his salvation with the Chinese over here, and then, he'd, then another part, another chapter with, with this group of people over here, another part of the earth, and over here. He had to bring the story together, so he had to have a people, a nation, through whom he would work, and through whom he would bring his Messiah. Does that make sense? So they are chosen, but they're not chosen because they're better. They're chosen because they're chosen. God just said, I'm going to use you to bring about the plan of salvation. You say, well, why are they so blessed? Why are they so protected? Because of God's covenant. He is a God of covenant, and they are still chosen people. And he's going to keep his covenant. And he's still completing the story, right? He's still fulfilling the story. The story isn't done yet. 
and the storyline runs through the people of Israel. That's why there will always be a nation of Israel. That's why there will always be the Jewish people, because he's still running that thread through those people. He's keeping his covenant, and he has to run that thread through those people to fulfill what we're still coming into. Okay. So God's dealing with Israel, and he establishes a nation. There are three elements required to establish a nation. People. How am I doing on time? Oh, I'm done, aren't I? Okay. To be continued. People, law, and land. Let me put it this way. You have to have borders to have a nation. Right? I mean, God established that in the Old Testament. You got to have a land to have a people to have a nation. Can I just use one word to describe that? If you don't get that, duh. 